It's a pleasure for Betty and me to be with you this morning. We've appreciated the prayers, the fellowship, the study, and the joy that we sense here. I'm acutely aware that everyone who comes to a place like this on a Saturday morning comes with uh, sorrows, comes with concerns, comes with frustrations, comes with sins and temptations. And so it's my desire that this time will be entirely given over to God and His Spirit. And it's my prayer that uh, by the time we leave here this morning, it'll be with a lighter step, with more joy, more hope, more courage, and certainly with the knowledge that we serve a God who is alive and well on planet Earth and that we can have lots and lots of hope for our future. I'd like to share with you a, a short story this morning that's not very well known. And this story is found in the Second Kings, the Old Testament book, Second Kings. And it's in chapter 13. And if you want to take a look at it, you're welcome. If not, just feel free to listen. But it's in Second Kings 13 and beginning at verse 14 and going on from there. But I just want to tell the story rather than read it. So Elisha was the prophet of the time. And Elisha was getting uh, really old and really sick. In fact, Elisha was on his last legs. He was about to die. And the king of the time, the king of Israel of the time, was named Jehoash. J-E-H-O-A-S-H. Can you say it with me? Jehoash. He's not a well-known king, but he was the king of the time. And Jehoash, when he heard that Elisha was about to die, was very alarmed, very concerned and upset because Jehoash felt that the only reason the kingdom of Israel was making any progress at all or staying alive at that difficult time was because of Elisha, because of Elisha's faith and Elisha's prayers and Elisha's counsel. So Jehoash went down to visit Elisha on his deathbed and the king just wept over Elisha. And my father, he said, you are like a father to me. And essentially what, what uh, the king said to Elisha was, you're the only thing keeping us from disaster. If you die, we're all sunk. So here is a king who uh, doesn't have much faith, doesn't have much hope, doesn't have much courage for the future. A king who really believes that the kingdom is about to sink and die away because the prophet is going to his final rest. And Elisha, I really love what Elisha did next. Elisha did something quite fascinating. Elisha said to the king, he said, get a bow and some arrows. And then it says, so he did. And I did too. I got a bow and I got some arrows. And I'm told by good authority from uh, the sales clerk at um, the warehouse here in Whangarei that this was the original bow and arrow set from back in those days. Yes, even back then things were made in China. <laughs> but anyway... The king got a bow and he got some arrows. And uh, then Elisha said, uh, hold the bow in your hands. So Elisha held the bow in his hands. And then Elisha did something quite fascinating. Elisha somehow got up out of his deathbed, came up to where the king was standing uh, by the window and the king, uh, Elisha said, open the east window. And then the king came up and the king put his hands. I'm sorry, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Elisha, since he was very close to death, probably didn't have any strength left to pull the string of a bow and shoot an arrow. But he found the strength of God to come up to the king and put his hands on the king's hands. And so 
they opened the east window. Elisha said to the king, shoot. And so the king took the arrow. He pulled back the bow, pulled it tight, released, and the arrow shot out of the window. And all the time, the king's hands were on, I'm sorry, the prophet's hands were on the hands of the king as he shot the arrow. And then Elisha made a pronouncement. Elisha said, that's the Lord's arrow. Two things really stand out in this story for me, and I hope they do for you as well. First of all, that the, the prophet put his hands on the hands of the king. So in fact, it was really the prophet's hands that were shooting the arrow. King's hands were on the bow, on the arrow, but the prophet's hands were there too. What do you get from that? I think you probably get the same thing I get. My friends, whatever you do throughout the course of your week, for yourself in life and for God, for your family or whatever, when your hands are on the bow and the arrow, it is really God's hands that are there. And so if you are a parent and you are symbolically shooting some arrows, you are acting on behalf of your family. My friends, it is God who is acting through you. It is God who has his hands on your hands. If you work making something in construction or engineering, it is God's hands that are on your hands. If you are speaking, it is God's voice that speaks through your voice. I find this a wonderfully encouraging thought, don't you? It is God who is doing it for you and through you and in you. You are not there all by yourself. When you face those issues in life, God is there with you. His hands are on your hands. His heart is with your heart. His voice is with your voice. And so you may win. I'll never forget one time when I was uh, quite young. I was at Avondale College uh, in Australia. I was in my early 20s. And uh, they were having a student-led week of prayer. And I was asked to do the opening night. It was a Friday night. And we were studying the book of Joshua. And so many weeks ahead of time, I studied Joshua chapter 1, which was my assignment. But for some strange reason, every time I sat down to study that chapter, I couldn't get anything out of it. It was most unusual because most often when I would sit down with God's Word, all kinds of thoughts would rush into my mind. But whenever I opened Joshua chapter 1, weeks and weeks ahead, it was like a blank, empty page. I had no inspiration no thoughts of any kind that I could share. As the time grew closer, I was growing very, very desperate, very nervous. And I won't prolong the agony too much for you. I'll just tell you that on the Friday night, I was sitting out back here on a chair like this, and they were going through all of the stuff ahead, getting ready for me to speak. And I still didn't have a clue what I was going to say. I had no notes written out, nothing in my mind, nothing in my heart. And finally, it was inevitable. I wished I could rush out of that hall. There were several hundred students waiting to hear what I had to say. And I remember going up to the podium and just grabbing a hold of it and crying out to God, God, if anything happens here tonight, you're going to have to do it because I have nothing to give. I have no memory of what happened next. But I do know that at the end of my talk, a no, quite a number of people came to me with words of appreciation, letting me know that the arrow had hit its mark, that what I had said that night was exactly what they needed and wanted to hear. You see what happens, friends? When we are helpless, he steps in. 
It reminds me of Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 11, where God said, The words that I speak will not return to me empty. Remember that verse? They will accomplish what I want them to do. They will do exactly what I sent them to do. Now, the word that is used there in Isaiah 55 for sent means this. It means let loose, release, or shoot like an arrow. <laughs> I love the Bible, don't you? I love God's Word. Shoot like an arrow. And so God says, when I ask you to speak my word for me, it is as if you are shooting an arrow and my hands are on your hands. My voice is working through your voice. My mind is your mind. My heart is your heart. My very life is your body and your life and your energy. It's the same word that's used there in Isaiah 55 where it says, my words will do what I send them to do. That's the same word that's used when that story, remember, of David and Jonathan, and they were shooting the arrow as a signal as to whether it was safe for David to stay around or to get going. Same word. That Hebrew word means stretching out, like when Moses stretched out his hand for the plagues or for crossing the river. That's the same word. Shooting an arrow, letting loose. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, God says, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Same word again. Whom shall I send? Whom shall I release? Whom shall I shoot? <laughs> In a, not that the person will be shot, but the person will do the shooting. <laughs> and then it says, Here am I, send me. It's as if, my friends, God is coming to you today and He's saying, I want somebody to send. I want somebody who can shoot my words like an arrow out to people around them. And then it's as if we stand up and we say, Lord, I don't feel very confident. I don't feel very capable. But here I am. Shoot. And God takes us, and He puts His hands on our hands, and He lets us do marvelous things for Him. The very last time in the Old Testament where uh, that word send or release or let loose is used is in Malachi 3 and Malachi 4. And there it says, the Lord says, I am sending my messenger. I am sending you Elijah the prophet. Now at that time, as you know, Elijah was long dead. Elijah came before Elisha that we just talked about. And clearly here in Malachi 3 and Malachi 4, the Lord is talking prophetically about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right here at the end of the Old Testament, before the New Testament begins, God says, I am about to shoot. I am about to send. I am going to give you my messenger, capital M. I am sending you Elijah the prophet. And that was a promise that the Father in heaven was sending his own beloved son, shooting his son, in other words, releasing His Son into this world to come and walk among us and to give us the Word of God which would not return to the Father empty. Right there in Malachi chapter 3 and 4, it says that the work of that messenger, the work of that sent one, would be to restore hearts. I know that my heart needs restoration. And you are no doubt aware just by your presence here this morning that your heart needs restoration. Now, something that needs restoration is something that has been damaged. If a piece of furniture has been damaged or, or just scratched or, or broken, we talk about restoring that piece of furniture. A work of art has been blemished or torn maybe. And so experts will restore that work of art. 
You and I are God's work of art. You and I are God's construction, if you like. We are fashioned after His image. But we have all been damaged. We have all been torn. We have all been wounded. We have all fallen apart. And the great work which Christ, the Son of God, does is to restore our hearts, to restore our whole lives. I love that work, don't you? And if there's anyone here this morning who feels a need for having your heart restored to God, for having your life made beautiful once again, I invite you to take advantage of everything that the Son of God was sent by the Father to do. Jan, this morning I did appreciate when you said that uh, your favorite verse in all the Scriptures is John 5, 24. That's something you and I have in common. And for the last several years now, I don't think I have preached one sermon without mentioning John 5, 24. It's so beautiful. I always put it in somewhere. I can always find, way, find a way to include John 5, 24, no matter what the subject is. And that, of course, is where Jesus stood up in front of the people and said, If anyone hears my word and believes the Father who sent me, that person has eternal life. That person will not come into condemnation. One translation says, That person needs have no fear of judgment because that person has already passed from death to life. And whenever I think about that promise of Jesus, I just think like, I, I just want to say, praise God, hallelujah. I want to become truly Pentecostal <laughs> over that verse. Are you with me on that? It's a praise to God, isn't it? It's the heart of everything we're here for. I love it so much. And I'm claiming right now that promise uh, from Isaiah 55, that, that Jesus has chosen to share that promise with you this morning. And the Father in heaven is pleased with that. And the Father in heaven is saying, I believe right now, that word which my Son has given will not come back to me empty. I have shot out that arrow. My hands were on that bow and that arrow as it went out. And it will come back to me and it will produce some results for my kingdom. And so again, if there's anyone here this morning who feels a need for restoration of heart, mind, soul, and life, who feels a need for making confession of sin, we call that repentance, I encourage you to take the opportunity this morning to do that and to follow up again on that in your own life this afternoon and to tell someone about that by the end of the day. And you will find yourself renewed and restored in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's another part of the story here that took place between Elisha the prophet and Jehoash the king that I want to draw your attention to. And this part is described in 2 Kings 13 and verses 18 and 19. So, this is part B of the story. So... Um, Elisha says, now king, um, get some arrows. So the king got some arrows. He pulled out an arrow. <clears throat> and then Elisha said, strike the ground. I'll pretend this is the ground since these are short arrows. They won't reach the ground. <laughs> so Elisha, the prophet said to the king, strike the ground. So the king struck the ground with an arrow. And Elisha just waited. So the king struck the ground again with an arrow. And Elisha just waited. So the king struck the ground again with an arrow a third time. And the king just waited and waited. But three was enough. The king struck the ground just three times with the arrow. 
And then it's really quite fascinating because the prophet Elisha then became angry with the king. So he may have been at death's door, but he wasn't too old and too sick to get angry. <laughs> but it was a righteous anger. And the prophet said to the king, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have won the war over your enemies. You would have completely destroyed them. But now you will win only how many? Three battles. Don't you find this a fascinating story? It's like the prophet was saying to the king, you will win as many battles as you believe you will win. You will win as many battles as you trust God to win. It's an easy thing for the king in the room there with the prophet to strike an arrow on the ground. That's easy. The harder thing is to go out and actually win a battle. But the prophet is saying, the battle is won right here. The battle is won at the point of belief in God. The battle is won with your attitude before you even go out onto the battlefield. If you had struck the arrow to the ground five or six times. You would have won complete victory. The prophet didn't say, strike the arrow three times. The, strike, the prophet didn't say, strike the arrow six times. The prophet didn't say, strike the arrow once. It was entirely up to the king how many times he struck the arrow to the ground. And my friends, it is entirely up to us how many victories we will win. God wants to give us every victory he can. But he does make the choice ours. You remember when Gideon had his army? What did he have? Some 32,000 people or something lined up to go out and do battle? And God told Gideon, you have too many. You have too many who would rather go on home if they had a chance. So send them on home if they want to go home. And most of the army left. They went all the, down, all the way down to, how many was it? I think I made a note of that. They went all the way down to 10,000. So 10,000 soldiers went out to do battle. And God said to Gideon, you still have too many. We need to get them down to those who are really committed. So you know they had another little test. We won't describe, take time to describe that. They had another little test. They got all the way down to 300 men, 300 soldiers who were desperately committed to win the victory for God. Do you see? The difference was one of attitude. Attitude. And those 300, so to speak, were willing to strike the arrow as many times as it took to the ground in order to win the victory for God. Back when the Israelites were crossing into the promised land, this is from Joshua chapter 1, <laughs> every place where you set your foot is yours. In other words, God opens up the entire promised land to the people. It's called the promised land because God promised it to them in entirety. But how much of that land they actually take is up to them. They have to set their feet. And if they get discouraged, if they get weary, if they pull back, if they lose hold of the promise... If they take their eyes off God, if they become comfortable with where they are and fail to keep the vision going, then that's as far as they will go. And I guess my question for myself and for you this morning is this. How far have you gone? How many more steps are you willing to take? How many more arrows are you willing to strike on the ground. How many more times are you willing to say, God, I see another battle ahead. 
I can't do it, but you and I together, we can win the battle. And when, he, when the king shot that arrow, remember, the prophet said, that is the Lord's arrow. My friends, everything we do for God and the kingdom is the Lord's arrow. Do you agree? When I am speaking here this morning, I am not speaking my words. I didn't make this up somewhere. I didn't sit down to write this like a novelist would sit down to write a novel. I got this from what was already written by God. This is God's word, and it is simply our privilege, humbly, to share that as best we can. And so when we send out the word of God by the way we live and by what we say, by our attitude, by the look on our faces, by our acts of service for others in the community, when we do all that, my friends, it is not our arrow we are shooting. It is the Lord's arrow. And that arrow will find its mark. That arrow will reach its target. That arrow will defeat the enemy who is against us. That arrow will bring glory to God. That arrow will complete the work. And all of the praise and all of the thankfulness will go to God in heaven above. I want to... Um, share with you a story <clears throat> to illustrate what we're talking about this morning. There was a modern day apostle. And by the way, the word apostle in the New Testament means what? One who is sent. There's the arrow again. <laughs> when you look at the word apostle in the New Testament, every time you see it, think arrow of the Lord. Someone who is released. Someone who is sent forth. Someone who gives out the word and the power of God. There was a modern day apostle who was truly an arrow of the Lord. He died in 1929. So this is fairly recent times, historically. He was known as the Apostle with the Bleeding Feet. And his name was Sundar Singh. Singh spelled S-I-N-G-H. Sundar Singh. And I want to tell you right up front... That if Sundar Singh had been there with Elisha, when Elisha said, strike the arrow to the ground, Sundar Singh would have been striking the arrow to the ground for the rest of the day until Elisha finally said, that's probably enough. <laughs> that's the kind of man that Sundar Singh was. But let's go back to the beginning. When Sundar Singh was a boy in school, he was not like the other boys. He was more thoughtful. He, he seemed to be in his own world of, of thoughts. He seemed to be a, a, a very naturally religious boy. And the priest of the school that he was at at that time said, This man, this boy, will become great. If he doesn't go crazy. A little later on, Sundar went to a Christian school because it happened to be the school closest in his Indian village. And he did well at that school, but when he was nearly 14 years old, his mother died and his world collapsed. Sundar suddenly became violent. Everything that he lived for and hoped for surrounded his mother and her influence on his life. And now she was gone. And Sundar came to hate the God that had taken his mother away from him. At the Christian school, he was a changed young man and not for the better. His teachers were praying for him. And one day they were quite, uh, quite happy quite relieved when he came to them and said he asked for a copy of the New Testament. 
They thought maybe there's a breakthrough. Maybe he's going to do something good now. But he took that copy of the New Testament that they gave him. And after school, he gathered some friends around him. And he took some matches and he took some kerosene. And he tore the pages out of that New Testament and burned them with the matches and stomped them into the ground. His father found him doing that and said, Are you crazy? Are you mad? That Christian book is a good book. You shouldn't be doing that. Shortly afterwards, Sundar decided that he would not continue his life. He began to plan his suicide. He planned that when the train came along not far from his home, as it did every morning at 5 o'clock, that he would be out on that train track and he would lay his body down on the track and he would let his miserable life come to an end. So he was in his room. He told no one about his plan. He was in his room and he decided that he would spend the night just contemplating and meditating. So he took a bath and he said something like this to God. He said, God, if you are real, you must reveal yourself to me tonight. And if you do not reveal yourself to me, I am going to follow through with my plan at 5 o'clock in the morning. And so he stayed awake the whole night, waiting and hoping that Jesus would somehow reveal himself to him. At 4.45 a.m., 15 minutes before the train was to come, and just before Sunda was ready to make his way down to the tracks, a heavenly being appeared in his bedroom. And he recognized that heavenly being to be none other than Jesus himself. And Jesus spoke to Sundar. And Jesus told Sundar that he loved him very much. Told him that his sins were forgiven. And Jesus called Sundar to be an apostle. To be his messenger told Sundar that he would send him out to win many people for the kingdom of God. The vision, the presence, lasted about 15 minutes. And at the end of it, Sundar burst into his father's room and he said, I have seen Jesus. <laughs> his father thought he had gone crazy. His father didn't really know what he was talking about. That's funny, Betty. <laughs> Just on my little device here, it came up giving me a reminder that our wedding anniversary is coming up. <laughs> That's never happened to me while I've been preaching for one this before. <laughs> so I have no excuse. <laughs> oh, man. August 12, right? <laughs> 2000, right? <laughs> oh, anyway. I don't know if that was from Jesus, but. <laughs> Sundar decided he was going to be, from that point on, a disciple for Jesus Christ. His father encouraged him to be just a secret disciple. Because it was dangerous to be a Christian. Dangerous to be a Christian apostle in that land. But Sundar said, no. I'm going to openly be a servant of Jesus Christ. He put on a yellow turban and robe like a teacher of his time. He was baptized on his 16th birthday, and one month later, he went out into the villages. He had a tremendous physique. He was more than six feet tall. When he walked around from place to place to place to place, he would walk with uh, bare feet. And that's why he became known as the apostle of the bleeding feet. Sundar decided he would go into Tibet, the forbidden land. His first visit into Tibet was at age 19. Very soon after he gave his first sermon in a public place, he was taken a hold of by those who opposed him. He was beaten almost to his death. His arm was fractured. 
He was thrown down a dry well, and when he landed in the well, he realized that he had landed on top of corpses. For three days and three nights, he was in that well, feeling fairly sure that he was going to die. He had been told there was only one key to the lid which was over that well. And the Grand Lama, the, the chief leader of the village nearby, was the one who kept that only key around his waist day and night. But in the middle of the night, Sunda heard a stirring. And he saw the light come through as the cap of that well was pulled aside. And a rope was lowered down to him, and there was a loop in the rope. He put his leg through the loop and held on to the rope with his good arm, and he was lifted up through the well. And he went out, and he preached again in the same village. The Grand Lama came out. He looked at the, the uh, key ring around his waist, and sure enough, the only key was still attached to his waist. He was expelled from that village, but he went on to other villages. In another village, he was beaten unconscious. He was wrapped in a blanket. He was dragged into the forest and left to die. But people came out and ministered to him. They whispered to him that they were secret disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ who had been sent to save his life. In Nepal, in one place. He was thrown into prison. But there in that prison, he was singing and preaching all night. They took him out of the prison. They tied him to boards. They took him into the marketplace while he was still singing. He was dragged before a judge. The judge condemned him to die. He was thrown on a rubbish heap after being further beaten. But once again, when darkness fell, Secret underground Christians came out and ministered to him and tended to his wounds and gave him something to drink and encouraged him in the Lord and prayed with him. And so he went on to preach again. Even nature had respect for Sundar Singh. One day Sundar was visiting with some friends at a villa on the edge of a forest. And Sundar decided he would go for a little walk into the forest itself. And so he walked along through the trees at the edge of the forest, praising God and praying to the, to the Father. But as his friends watched from the veranda of the villa, they were shocked and afraid because they saw coming up behind Sundar was a leopard stalking him, ready to pounce. They dared not cry out, for fear of disturbing the leopard and making the situation even worse. But as they watched, Sunda realized that something was behind him. He turned around. He stretched out his hand to the leopard. The leopard came up and he, he nuzzled the, the leopard. He just stroked the head of the leopard. And the leopard nuzzled his hands. And then the leopard went away. <clears throat> One day... Sundar was walking in the Himalayas with a Buddhist monk. It was cold. It was winter. It was snowing. They were on their way to the safety of a monastery when suddenly they heard a cry for help. Someone, a man, way down, had fallen off the pathway. And he was crying out for rescue. And the Buddhist monk who was with Sundar said, God has brought this man to his fate. He must work it out for himself. Let us hurry on before we too perish. No, said Sundar, God has sent me here to help my brother. I cannot abandon him. And so Sundar, while the Buddhist monk went on to the monastery, Sundar climbed down, a treacherous climb down in the snow and ice. He found the man had a broken leg. By the strength God gave him, he was able to lift the man up to carry him back up to the track. And then he carried the man along the trail in the darkness toward the monastery. Finally, he stumbled. It was stumbling over something in the track. And when he looked down, he saw the frozen body of his companion. The Buddhist monk who had decided to go on had been overcome by the cold and was frozen dead on the trail. 
while Sundar's very act in climbing down to rescue somebody else had given his body that extra surge of adrenaline that was needed to save not only the life of the man who had fallen, but also his own life. Years later, someone asked Sundar, what is life's most difficult task? And he responded, to have no burden to carry. At last, in 1929, at the age of 40, Sundar had been ill for two years, but he decided, regardless of that, that he was going to go back into Tibet to share the gospel again. His friends begged him not to go. They said, you are sick, you are not well. If you go into Tibet this time, you will never return. And he responded, when I go into Tibet, I never expect to return. And that was the last that anyone saw of Sundar Singh. We can only assume that with his dying breath, he was still the apostle of the Lord, the one sent by the Lord, the one who was being shot as an arrow, the one who was taking the word and the message of God, taking the messenger of Jesus Christ himself to people who desperately needed him. And that ministry, my friends, still bears fruit today as it has through the generations in that part of the world. You may not be a Sundar Singh, but you are a somebody. You are a disciple, and you may be an apostle, a sent one for God. The question is, will you accept that the king's hands are on your hands, whatever you are doing for God? Will you be an arrow for the Lord? And when you are invited, will you strike the arrow to the ground again and again and again and again and again and again. We would invite you to stand and sing. Our song is Near the Cross, Near the Cross, number 312.
And so our minds are drawn to the cross. And we're so grateful, Lord Jesus Christ, that when the Father called you in and said, now is the time to go. Now is the time for me to send you, to release you into the earth. We're so glad that you stood there and said, okay, Father, I'm ready. Shoot. <laughs> and thank you, Lord Jesus, that you found your mark. You found your mark in my mind, my life. You found your mark in the life of everyone here today. You found your mark in the life of Sundar Singh and the Apostle Paul and so many like them. You find your mark in all who are seeking you today and who long for a better way to live than is offered by the society in which we find ourselves. So, Father, I pray that each one of us will be renewed in our experience with you this morning. I pray, Lord, that any who are here for the first time or just passing through will leave with a strong sense of, their, of your love for them and a strong conviction that their lives may be different from this point on as they respond to you and to the word which you have spoken and shared with them today. And so, Father, we're pleased to leave ourselves in your care. We pray for every child here this morning, every young person, every teenager, every young adult, every older person. Together, Lord, may we courageously say, here we are, send us. And then, Lord, may we see you face to face very soon. Thank you for all that you are to us and all that you do for us and through us. From this point on, may your hands be on our hands as we shoot those arrows for the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.